Heavenly Father, we beseech thee. I kneel before you as a member of this age-old craft, praying to you for guidance as I am on a journey. A journey for more light, but more especially light that has been lost, forgotten, or hidden among the ages gone by. The light that connects us with our very meaning and informs us of our purpose. Light locked deep within our past, beyond lips that no longer speak, and paths forgotten, no longer traveled. Aid me in my pursuit, Lord, for historical light. Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects within Freemasonry. As always, I'm your host, Brother Alex Powers, and I want to thank you for joining us once again as we continue our quest for Historical Light in episode number 7, which will be discussing the history behind Freemasonry in South Korea. Now, today's episode is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Masonic Revival. If you haven't checked them out, do so at their website, MasonicRevival.com, where you'll find some wonderful quality neckties, bow ties, lapel pins, and so much more. So if you're looking to spruce up for your next lodge night or lodge event, definitely go there and get some great quality products. And you can use that um, promo code HLIGHT to get free shipping on your entire order. So make sure you do that today, support the sponsor of the show, and get some great quality merchandise with free shipping. Again, that promo code is HLIGHT, all one word. Now, let's start off the show by jumping over to our friends at masonrytoday.com to find out what happened in Masonic history today. Today in Masonic history, Charles Samuel Myers was born in 1873. Brother Myers was an English physician and psychologist. Uh, he was born in London, England and attended the City of London School and would later attend college at Cambridge University. While attending college there, he was able to travel and on an anthropological expedition. And on that expedition, he studied ethnic music and carried out research on rhythm in Borneo. He would graduate with a doctorate in medicine in 1901. Also in 1901, Myers would become the, uh, or one of the founding members of the British Psychological Society. He would uh, be the organization's secretary for a number of years, as well as a president. 1909, when W.H.R. Rivers, a research collaborator of Myers, resigned uh, part of his lectureship duties, Myers became the first lecturer at Cambridge University whose sole task was lecturing on experimental psychology. Two years later, Rivers and Myers would become co-editors of the British Journal of Psychology. Then in 1914, Rivers would step down and Myers would continue as the sole editor until 1924. In 1912, Myers used his abilities in fundraising to get enough money to establish the first English laboratory especially designed for experimental psychology. He would be the laboratory's first director and would hold the position until 1930. In 1915, Myers was given commission in the Royal Army Medical Corps. Uh, that same year, he was the first one to use the term shell shock in an article, although in 1940 he admitted that he was not the person that came up with the phrase. But regardless of the origin of the term, Myers did work tirelessly to get the help needed for the soldiers suffering from shell shock. He did become increasingly frustrated with the military leadership as they were not interested in his theories. Myers did unfortunately pass away on October 12, 1946. Uh, Myers was an active Freemason and was involved in the founding of several Masonic lodges. Among the various lodges he uh, belonged to, he was a member of Isaac Newton Lodge number 859, which he was initiated into back in 1895. All right, so thank you to our friends at masonrytoday.com for that great article. Definitely check them out at their website and on social media and subscribe so you can keep up with the wonderful Masonic history they put out on a daily basis. Now, I got to give out a huge shout out. I just got back from some Masonic traveling over the weekend with my father-in-law and Masonic brother, Angelo Mino, who you might recognize from the intro of the show. Uh, we had the chance to travel out to Branson, Missouri. It's about three hours, 45 minutes from here. Uh, they were putting on a Masonic third degree in an underground cave hosted by the Oklahoma Masonic Indian Degree Team, who, if you remember in an earlier episode, we had the chance to interview uh, their secretary, Brother David Dill. So I was extremely excited to get to meet him in person and see the work that they do. I uh, never had the chance to actually see it in person before. So all in all, it was an amazing day. 
Um, both kind of a bucket list to see the degree team, a degree in a cave. I've heard about them, but I've never uh, actually experienced that. So it was pretty amazing. The brothers in Branson, huge shout out. You guys were amazing. So hospitable. I uh, met a lot of new friends. Um, man, I really got to point out Most Worshipful Richard L. Smith, the Grand Master of Most Worshipful State of Missouri, the friendliest guy I think I've ever met. You know, I, I just have to point that out because it really goes to show how we are all on the level. Uh, it doesn't matter the position that anyone holds. At the end of the day, we are brothers. And uh, the chance to stand and have that conversation with him, he has got to be one of the friendliest guys I've ever met. And that really just stood out, with, uh, stood out for me. I walked away from that going, wow, that guy was so friendly. So it was great meeting everybody. Uh, the degree team did a wonderful job. It was a great experience all around. Um, thank you to my wife for allowing me to go. I know we had some questionable weather coming in both ways. Luckily, we were able to pretty much avoid it all the way around and uh, made it back with uh, no hazardous conditions uh, really putting us in any danger. So it was a wonderful day, a great experience. I really enjoyed it. And uh, if you guys put one on again, I'll make sure to be there because I uh, really, really enjoyed that experience. So I want to point out I'm wearing one of the historical light masonic lapel pins that we've got out now um, if you enjoy the show please go to our website and consider buying one of these uh, the proceeds go 100 percent back into the show uh, it's a fundraising event to offset the um, hosting costs and the equipment upkeep and just the overall continuance of the show money's not going into my pocket it's going directly right back into the show to make this show last longer grow bigger and better over time and keep bringing you uh, the masonic history you love and desire so go to our website, historicallight.com, check out the shop section, and pick up one of these lapel pins. They're going for $10 a piece, and again, that goes directly back into the show uh, to offset the uh, hosting fees, the equipment upkeep, and just keep us growing over time. So if you would consider buying a pin today, I'd really appreciate that, and we'll make sure to keep bringing you quality material here on Historical Light. Now, let's go ahead and jump into tonight's episode, which we're going to be covering the history behind Freemasonry in South Korea. I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. We'll see you when the uh, interview's done. Thank you, everybody, for joining us again. A wonderful interview for you tonight on Historical Light. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us Brother Roger Haynes. And he's going to be filling us in on the history behind uh, Freemasonry in South Korea. Before we get into the main topic, though, I'd like to ask you, Brother Haynes, what is it that brought you to Freemasonry in the first place? Well, I'm what I'm 33 now. Uh, I've been a Mason since I was 21, and uh, really, I mean, when I was what maybe about a month before I on, I went to my father's open installation, and uh, I said, "Hey, this is kind of cool." So, so when I turned 21, uh, you know, I had petitioned to the lodge, and I mean, really, I mean, I didn't really know anything about Freemasonry, and I didn't, I didn't bother to look anything up. Like the real reason I joined is just because, you know, I just I wanted to spend more time with dad. That's really all the only reason I, I joined initially. I mean, you know, after I joined, I got a lot more out of it and I'm glad I did. But yeah, it was just basically I just wanted to hang out with dad because he liked it so much. And, you know, so and now me and him, we're uh, we're best friends. So that's great. That's wonderful. So it sounds like your father's a Freemason. Do you have uh, other uh, family history within the craft as well? Uh, probably some distant relatives. Uh, I mean, Haynes is kind of a common name in Digby, Nova Scotia, and uh, probably a few uh, distant relatives that probably are Masons. But as far as uh, my immediate extended family, uh, just just my dad. Wonderful. Well, brother, if you don't mind, we'll uh, jump into the main topic tonight. You're going to be speaking the history of Freemasonry within South Korea. Um, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about how you, uh, how you came to be in the craft in that part of the world? Sure. Well, uh, I, I, I have been living in Korea for the last seven years. Uh, when I first moved there, uh, I was uh, teaching English. And uh, about a month in, I didn't really, I didn't really, I wasn't really that happy. So I called up dad and I, ted, I said, dad, I'm not really happy here in, in Korea. I think I'm going to come home. And he told me, Roger, did you look for a lodge? I said, oh, no, I didn't. So I looked up online 
and I found two lodges. I was living in Seoul at that time. I found uh, a lodge that was under the Grand Lodge of the Philippines, and then I found a lodge that was under the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And I said, and I knew my, I knew I knew enough history to know, oh, Scottish masonry, you know, Freemasonry comes from Scotland. I was kind of interested in that, so I, I kind of got drawn into it. I contacted them, and then uh, about, I don't know, less than six months later, I installed as the inner guard, <laughs> and it just went from there. Uh, I learned about the, uh, the, the history of that lodge. Um, Freemasonry in Korea has been in Korea for almost 110 years now. Okay. Uh, the first lodge, it was, it was in Seoul, uh, for, uh, was chartered in 1908 uh, from the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Now, uh, as, you, as you're probably aware, Alex, that uh, you know, as the British Empire expanded, so did Freemasonry. So uh, Freemasonry has been in the Far East uh, for a uh, couple of centuries, uh, as far back as uh, the late 18th century. And uh, it, it started in Canton and then moved out from there. Um, our district for Scotland, because Scotland has districts all over the world, that district is the district of the Far East, and that's located in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is basically the hub of Freemasonry, uh, British Freemasonry in the Far East, because you have uh, lodges there from Ireland, England, and Scotland as well. So but, uh, they got the charter in 1908. And at that time, in 1908, uh, most of foreigners in Seoul were just uh, uh, merchants, uh, miners, and uh, missionaries. And uh, they met in various places. Uh, sometimes they even would meet in a mine shaft in a degree there, believe oh, it or wow. not. Yeah. Um, eventually, in the 1920s, they started meeting in the place called uh, the Seoul Club. At that time, the Seoul Club, it was a diplomatic and a consular kind of club where foreigners would meet. Um, around the same time I started meeting there, that uh, establishment burned down. And uh, the, uh, the lodge, they, uh, they opted to rebuild the Soul Club. And, uh, and by doing that, the Soul Club allowed them to meet there in perpetuity. Um, the lodge was uh, Hanyang. Hanyang is the uh, the ancient name of uh, the capital city of uh, back when it was the Empire of Korea, uh, when the North and South were, were still part uh, one, and uh, the, the ancient capital was called Hanyang. So they named the lodge after that. Um, now, of course, this is the early 20th century, and uh, if you're if you probably know your history, you knew that Korea was occupied by the Japanese at that time. Um, and they had, and it was under Japanese occupation. The law was that you weren't allowed to have secret societies. So to get around that, they simply acted and operated as a club, meeting in the Seoul Club. So it was just a bunch of foreigners getting together. Um, but the Japanese were very suspicious of their activity. You know, they'd be kind of standing outside the room uh, when they were having their meetings. They'd try breaking into the lodge room. Uh, and uh, they would, you know, constantly harass members and question them on their activities. Uh, it got so bad to the point, of course, that, you know, eventually forced into darkness uh, during the Second World War for a period of about five years, from 1940 to 1945. Uh, and they gave all the vital records to a certain brother. His name was uh, Alexander McFarland, and he kept all these records for safekeeping. And unfortunately, during the Second World War, he, he passed away. Uh, he didn't fight in the World War. He was just a retired miner. And he uh, passed away from old age. Uh, his wife, who is Japanese, she held on to these records. And when the, uh, the lodge reopened in 1945, um, she was able to give, uh, give back the records. And if it wasn't for those records, the lodge wouldn't have been able to reopen. So uh, for the fifth anniversary, uh, they uh, opted to make a tartan, uh, the lodge tartan. Each Scottish lodge was entitled to have their own regalia. Uh, if you were if you were watching the, the round table the other week, they were talking about uh, how the, the Scottish Grand Lodge was formed and uh, how they had to make concessions with all the time immemorial lodges in existence about a hundred or so years before. And part of that concession was 
each lodge was entitled to their own ritual and each lodge was entitled to their own regalia. Um, so uh, McFarland, uh, here's the, this is a, my past master apron. And the oh, tartan here, that. yeah, and the tartan here, this is uh, the ancient McFarland hunting tartan. So for the 50th anniversary, we adopted this as our lodge tartan to commemorate uh, brother Alexander McFarland, who uh, who unfortunately passed away, but uh, was able to keep a hold of those records during the Second World War when we were in darkness. Um, after the Second World War, we started growing again, but of course, then we had to go back into darkness because, you know, the Korean War, of course, happened. Um, and uh, after the after Korean War, uh, Freemasonry basically exploded in Korea, um, I mean, among the foreigners, uh, because the, the, the U.S. Army has stayed and they've stayed there ever since. And this was the 1950s, so of course masonry was, you know, really popular at that time in the states, especially among uh, servicemen. So they had brought over with them the uh, their square and compass clubs, uh, the York Rite, and the Scottish Rite as well. Uh, in the so in the 60s, you started seeing these other lodges pop up. Uh, I told you this lodge I mentioned before. It was under the Grand Lodge of the Philippines. Uh, which is very huge. Uh, Masonry is very huge in the Philippines. I've been there. I've had a chance to visit there uh, in my time in Asia. And uh, so they they uh, they chartered a lodge in Korea, and that name of the lodge is uh, MacArthur Lodge, after Douglas MacArthur, who was the, uh, the famous general in the Korean War. Um, and then later on in the early 70s, they created a Korean lodge for the Koreans in uh, Busan, which is part of the peninsula. And as I was saying before that, you know, the Scottish tradition uh, is to have, uh, you can have your entire ritual. There's about, there's five standardized Scottish rituals that are available for purchase from the Grand Lodge website. But if you wanted to, you could also write your own ritual and get it approved by the Grand Lodge. So what they did was, um, so I have, so there's three Scottish lodges in Korea, so I have three different rituals here. And, and I'm a past master of two lodges, so I had to learn a, a two different rituals. So uh, wow. this is the uh, this is the modern ritual. This is the one that Hanyang uses. And this is the uh, this is Busan's ritual. It's basically the same thing, except it was translated into Korean, the Korean language. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that they could have Koreans join the lodge if they couldn't speak English. Then they, they they could have that access to the to the ritual. Um, if there wasn't enough Korean members to actually perform the ritual in Korean, they would just give them a copy of the ritual in their Korean, so they could study it uh, afterwards. Um, later on in the 70s, uh, the servicemen had, uh, in Osan Air Base and United States Army Garrison Humphreys, which is uh, about 90 minutes south of Seoul, they uh, they also uh, asked for a charter from Scotland, and they chartered a military lodge, um, and the name of that lodge is Harry Truman, Lodge Harry S. Truman, and for their regalia, they adopted, and I also have my past master apron from here, uh, that's the uh, Harry S. Truman, the tartan, you can see it's the black watch tartan, it's pretty dark. But that's amazing. That's amazing. And that's the yeah, that's a military tartan, so they, they chose to adopt that tartan as their uh, uh, as their uh, official colors. Um, and yeah, it pretty much goes on from there. Uh, the uh, in about twenty years ago now, a few years ago, uh, Hanyang uh, resigned an agreement with the Soul Club. The Soul Club now it's not really a diplomatic consular. Now it's just an international business and sports center uh, or sports club. Um, but we were there, and uh, there was a there was a gentleman or a brother rather. His name was Gifford Cheeseman. And he was a past master of Hanyang. He was also a past president of the Seoul Club. And when he passed away, when we resigned this agreement, they had a, a room in the Seoul Club dedicated uh, to us. And in his name, so now it's called that's called the Cheeseman Room, and that's where Lodge Hanyang meets. And uh, it's named after uh, Past Master Gifford Cheeseman, and they allow us to hang our paraphernalia on the wall as well. 
So, and we're still allowed to meet there in perpetuity. So that's about the history, uh, the 110 year history. Uh, I could talk to you about some of the, uh, the activities that go on these days. I have, uh, I have a few photos. Okay. So, so this is the, uh, this is the, the Cheeseman room in, uh, in club. And, uh, so as you see, it doesn't really look like a lodge room. And the reason for that is because, uh, all of our uh, furniture and equipment is kept in the cabinets. So every, every, uh, Every meeting, the stewards come and they have to see the room. And then at the end of the meeting, they have to tear down the room and put everything back in the cabinets. So this is what uh, this is what it looks like after it's set up. Okay, so it, it doesn't really look like a proper lodge room, but it is uh, it is our room. So we we do like it. And afterwards, after this is after a meeting, the same room. So you can see everything's put back in the cabinet. And this is where we have our harmony, in which we uh, invite guests or applicants who uh, are interested in joining. Uh, this is our most recent installation. Uh, our installations are in September. And uh, this is the most recent one. And his name is Kevin Hess. Uh, in, it's a Scottish lodge, so it's uh, styled Right Worshipful Master. And that's his lovely wife, uh, Gemma. Uh, the nice thing about the Hanyang Lodge is that it's the premier uh, lodge in Korea, in Seoul. A lot of uh, international visitors from all over the world. Uh, I've met Masons from uh, South America and Africa and Europe and uh, Southeast Asia, all over. Uh, the gentleman in this uh, picture, he's passed away now, but uh, he's the uh, past Grand Master of Queensland uh, Grand Lodge, which is in Australia. Uh, this is a, uh, whoops, let me go back. Yeah, this, this is a picture from uh, a reunion. There's, because as you know, Korea is kind of a transient place. So there's a lot of past, ma past members of Hanyang that are in, that moved back to the States, but there's so many of them. So they decided one year to have a, a reunion. So there's about brothers from Hanyang that are still living in the States. They, they got together in Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, yeah, they got together in Pittsburgh, and they had a, a, a meeting. They got permission from, they got dispensation from Scotland to have a, to hold their own lodge meeting there. So that was kind of a reunion. Uh, here's a picture from uh, in, uh, installation banquet. Uh, I guess this is probably my installation. I'm giving a speech there. Um, this is uh, Mother's Day barbecue. It's usually one of our biggest events of the year. Uh, lots of people there. You can see. Uh, let's see. Here's three Korean brothers. They went over to Hong Kong when the the, the Grand Master of Scotland was visiting. Uh, that's the Grand Master of Scotland. His name is uh, Chuck Gordon. And so yeah, they were they they jumped on the chance to meet him because you know you don't really get a, living in Korea. You don't really get a chance to see it, to visit the with the Grand Master. Uh, this is another picture of a barbecue. We love barbecuing in uh, in Korea. This is a patio on the Soul Club. Uh, that's the district grandmaster of the Far East. So he's from Hong Kong. Uh, the district always comes over during our installations and they perform the installation ceremonies. And uh, he's uh, he just took a shot from the quake, that uh, little pewter bowl <laughs> over his head. That's a, a Scottish quake. It's kind of just basically a Scottish uh, shot glass. And usually the tradition is after you take the shot, you put it over your head to show that it's empty. Uh, we eat haggis because we're Scottish lodges, so we always have the piping in of the haggis. Uh, oh, this is an interesting story. Uh, this is uh, the man in the back there. He's uh, he's a pastor, and he, he wanted to check out what we were doing because, you know, all the sensation, sensationalism online and everything. So he said, <laughs> hey, I, I, I'd like to bring my, uh, a bunch of my, you know, people to the church to come over and see what you guys are about because we heard a bunch of things but we just wanted to see for ourselves so then I came over and we had we sat down and you know we had a we had a I was after a meeting so we sat down and and talked and they uh we dispelled it dispelled any myth any myths or uh you know misunderstandings that they might have had so it was a pretty positive experience for everyone uh this is a orphanage uh orphanage one of the orphanages that uh we like to uh volunteer with um and there's the brothers with the uh, the orphans. 
this is uh, this is another orphanage. This is uh, this is a really famous orphanage, actually. Uh, it's called uh, Give Out Love uh, Church, and it's basically uh, you see that box there. It's called the baby box, and basically, uh, if if usually unwed mom- mothers, if they can't take care of their babies, they would put the baby there, and uh, th- he was. He's actually, I think his name is what, Pastor Lee, and he's world famous. Um, One of the past masters, he had a friend who uh, worked for the L.A. Times, and he wrote an article about this this church and about him taking in uh, unwanted babies, and uh, he, uh, he became known internationally after that. That's so, that's amazing. Is that is that a common thing over there? I've I've never seen a, a drop off. No, 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 he, no, no. He, uh, he he was doing it out of the goodness of his own heart, and uh, he got a little bit of pressure from the government. But after he he uh, after he was known on the international stage, they uh, they kind of stopped pressuring him about it. So, uh, but yeah, he's been doing that for for a long time now. So we we do support that cause as well. Uh, uh, See, there's, yeah, this is our I mean, Hanyang is about half Korean membership, so every once in a while the Koreans they get and have uh, a family dinner. So this is one of their family dinners. Uh, this is yeah. Usually when the district grandmaster comes over for the installations, we give them gifts. But uh, so one thing that Hanyang usually does is that they'll they'll do a donation in his name. So they gave a donation to the Korean Red Cross in uh, under his name. We also do, uh, on Memorial Day, we go out to the Foreigner Cemetery. There's a special Foreigner Cemetery in uh, Seoul, and a lot of Masons are buried there. Uh, we plant little uh, Masonic flags uh, in, in front of the, the Masons' uh, graves that are buried there. This is Gifford Cheeseman, uh, who I mentioned before. He has the room named after him. This is his uh, grave. So we visit there once, uh, once a year and say a prayer and uh, put a little uh, flag on his uh, grave. That's one. Yep, and this is um, the other brother I mentioned, Alexander McFarland, who's uh, our tartan is named after. He's also buried there, and uh, that's uh, that's one of the past master's daughters. Uh, he likes to name give his kids uh, Masonic names. His son's name is Lewis, and his daughter's name is Star. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so she's she's a cutie. She's older now, but that was a while ago. But. Okay, I'll show you some uh, some of the Truman. So the Truman, the difference between Hanyang and Truman, uh, Hanyang is a uh, more of a white collar lodge, right? Because it's cosmopolitan and meets in the city. Uh, Truman is more of a blue collar lodge because it's mostly service men. And uh, so uh, this is their this is the old lodge building. Uh, they used to meet upstairs uh, above the VFW, but it was too small. It was always too cramped, and uh, they really couldn't do much in there except uh, sit around a, a, a tight space and have their meetings. So uh, they, they went out, uh, a couple of brothers, they went on a bike ride and they, they found this building. And they said, wow, this is a really nice building. And they called up the, the, uh, the rental, uh, the, uh, the realty, and they said, yeah, it's about you know this much per month. And they said, oh, we can do this. We can totally do this. So they went in, they renovated it, they put in a lodge room. Uh, this is on the river. That's that's basically the view, of the view from the path. Very very nice during the wow. summer. Yep. Um, and uh, this is the lodge room. So they renovated it. So they put in a square um, a squared pavement and uh, you know a celestial canopy. That's from one side and that's uh, the view from the other side. Um, probably, probably the nicest looking lodge room probably in Korea. Um, and here's the two brothers that did a lot of construction. Uh, Jordan Wallace on the left, uh, past master, and uh, uh, Michael Stone on the right, also past master, and he built the bar. Uh, now you have to understand this is masonry, and s- masonry in Britain, you know, uh, y- you can usually have a bar inside the lodge building. <laughs> That's kind of their tradition. So they they built the bar uh, their own two hands, uh, and that's the. The, the, the lounge is just right outside the uh, the lodge room, and the name of the lounge is the Keystone Lounge. And we have um, this is the recent installation from September, uh, and this is the uh, the current master, right, virtual master Chris Saint Germain, and his lovely wife Heidi, 
It's probably not the most flattering photo. If he sees this video, he'll probably kill me. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Truman. We like to have our own uh, attire as well. This is They call this the Truman suit. It's basically just a black watch, tartan trousers with an argyle jacket. Uh, oh, there's a cool thing. So in the Keystone Lounge, so you'll see there, we're in the lounge, but you'll see that there's the, the altar with the, the VSL open. This is what they call a table lodge, which is a Scottish tradition. So a table lodge is basically it's tiled. Um, the VSL is open. Uh, you're not wearing aprons, but you are you are wearing your uh, your collar jewel if you if you have. And, uh, there's a meeting, but we also have a meal during the meeting. And you'll see that uh, there's a blue. They put blue tape on the tables, and then you're supposed to put your glass on there. And you know if your you know if your glass moves off of the line, it means you want to talk. And you know it's one of those fun things. And then there's you know there's fines and and penalties and uh, things like that. So it's a it's a really good time. We, we do that, try to do that at least once a year. Oh, I had this uh, oil painting, a really nice oil painting of uh, Truman, because uh, it's the lodge's namesake. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some vandals broke in and then they gouged out his eyes. We tried getting it repaired, but uh, it, we couldn't do it. Um, there was one brother, he went over to the Philippines and he had a, a pastel version made it's it's okay but it's not as good as the original so oh yeah uh every oh, thanksgiving we roast a pig every thanksgiving thanksgiving is the probably the biggest event for truman lodge so uh yeah we usually we in the past we've ordered from fruit of commissary but we've all local pig as well uh it's usually fresher if we get the local pigs from korea uh and yeah there's a picture of the pig roasting it takes about you know about a day so it's usually an overnight thing we got to go there friday night and uh roast a pig all night you know we play guitar listen to music drink uh, have worth fun. the wait i'm sure oh it's well worth the wait definitely definitely yeah and then weeks and weeks of pulled pork barbecue for harmony afterwards <laughs> uh oh yeah so one thing that's cool about um scottish lodges is that they do the mark degree in the blue lodge you might not know that. Uh, for one thing, they don't call it Blue Lodge in Scotland. They call it Craft Lodge. But yeah, you can get your mark in uh, in the Craft Lodge without having to go for the York Rite. Interesting. So yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. The mark, yeah, the mark is uh, is pretty significant um, in British masonry. You know, they even have their own uh, Grand Lodges for Mark, mark like the Mark Master Masons Grand Lodges. So uh, you do need the Mark Master to join the Royal Arch. And you'll see the guy there on the left. He's wearing the Royal Arch uh, regalia. Um, you do need it to join the Royal Arch. You don't need to get it in the Royal Arch. Uh, the Royal Arch will do it for you if you don't have it. But most of the guys that join in Korea, they get it through the Blue Lodge. So uh, that's yeah. So that's from one of the the mark degrees that we did. That's wonderful, still- brother. Well, I, I've kind of let you just uh, go with the photos there. At- Kind of dumbfounded at it. It's it's amazing to really be able to uh, to soak up the uh, the lodge culture over there, and it seems like you have a great culture uh, within your lodge and the surrounding brothers over there. So that's that's amazing to have, and I want to thank you so much for sharing that. Um, now I, I see that it seems like there is a a, a healthy um, amount of uh, foreigners that are members of the lodge. Do you have a a good population of? Uh, uh, locals that join the lodge as well and i know we saw a few in there but what is the uh the difference between the uh, membership numbers that you see oh i would say it's mostly it's mostly foreigners but i mean i would say half half the lodge in hanyang in seoul is koreans um but in busan uh the majority the majority of the brethren are korean just let me uh i have some uh, some of their photos as well just let me bring that up that's their lodge room uh, that's their that's their regalia. maroon corduroy. I, I kind of like it actually. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of corduroy, so I kind of thought it was cool. Um, so yeah, this is their last installation. So yeah, they do have several Korean members. Um, I mean, one, two, three, four. It's a small lodge, but but more than half the membership is Korean. Okay, here's the photo I want to show you. So this is uh, the guy in the middle. That's uh, Brother Cho. He doesn't speak English at all. He he only speaks Korean. So they had to get how many is there? One, two, three, four, yeah, five Koreans, which is basically the number that you need to, to pull off a Korean 
ritual or a Korean degree, you need at least five Korean speakers to be able to pull it off. So they that day, uh, I wish I was there because I, I, I would have loved to have seen it, but I wasn't there. But they, uh, they did the ritual in Korean there. So I would say that, yeah, more than 50% of the membership in uh, Lodge Busan is Korean. So there is there is that uh, that number. Yeah, the most of them there are Koreans too. That is awesome. Well, I wasn't I wasn't expecting all the pictures, but thank you so much. That that was really amazing to get a, kind of a firsthand glimpse of the uh, uh, the passion of the group of members you have over there. That's uh, that's great. I mean, you you don't have a lot of uh, places here in the states that get that active um, of membership. So that's wonderful to see. Uh, I love to see that you guys are uh, taking it so serious into heart and uh, having a great time with it as well. Um, now, what brought you personally to Korea? What what landed you over there in the first place? Um, well, it's kind of embarrassing, but I was down on my luck. <laughs> I just, I, I, I was living in Toronto at the time. And I mean, um, yeah, the Toronto was at that time back in 2009, Toronto was probably the most expensive city in, uh, in the world at that time. And the only job I could land was just, uh, working in a factory with, uh, migrant, the Russian Israeli workers for, cash under the table. <laughs> so I was making, I was, I was making, I was not making a lot of money. Uh, I was making either enough to, um, for rent or to eat, but not both. So of course I had to pay for rent. So, uh, I lost a lot of weight. I was down on my luck. My sister, she had, she had lived in Korea for a few years teaching and she, so she said, Hey, why don't you, why don't you, you know, take better care of yourself, get on over there. So, yeah, so that was the main reason why I left in the first place. Hey, why not? And I right? liked it there so much. I liked it there so much, I ended up staying seven years. So, Well, that's wonderful. I mean, yeah, you, you get in with a community like that. I'm, I'm sure it'd be hard to hard to leave. And to get the mixture of cultures over there, that, that's amazing as well. I definitely have to add that to my uh, my bucket list of places to sure. visit Lodge. Sure. There's just one more thing I need to mention is that, of course, we have they have Prince, Ball, Prince Hall Lodges here, over here as well on the, uh, the U.S. Uh, military installations. And uh, for a while there, uh, when I first went to Korea, uh, recognition was kind of an issue, you know? And, uh, and so I had, to, I had to do research into it. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just pull up a few more uh, photos if you don't mind, because uh, this, is, this is important and this story kind of needs to be told. So we didn't really know that much about them. We knew that they were there and uh, one of the past masters and I were just riding through the on the car one day, and we heard it come on the uh, AFN radio that uh, hey, uh, any any uh, or like frat organizations, uh, you know, if you're if you're ancient free and accepted or free and accepted, we don't care. Just come on out to our uh, rep, rep, represent your fraternity uh, party. So we said, hey, that's kind of cool, an invitation. So you know, we got them and they invited us out, and uh, so this is from that. Uh, event that was like basically the first contact we had with them and i talked to so many brothers about it and they said you know oh prince hall this and prince hall that and they, they seemed to there seemed to be a negative stigma because there was no recognition so i had to do a lot of research you know i i wrote an article which i posted on my on my webpage uh, koreafreemason.com um i think there might be some errors in it i have to go back and uh, but uh basically i did a lot of research and uh, I learned that um, you actually you can anybody can join uh, African Lodge, which is the the first lodge uh, that was made. Um, it's a symbolic lodge now, but I found if you just if you send them a hundred bucks and your dues card, they'll uh, they'll they'll vote you in, make you a member. So I did that, and so here's a copy of my uh, my diploma from them from African Lodge 459 uh, Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. And there's my name, so. I, 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 because there was such a negative stigma surrounding Prince Hall at that time, I said, oh, I got to show these guys it's okay to be PH. <laughs> so I went and I gave them education on it. And so the stigma wasn't getting so bad. Um, and we started, we went out to a few more of their events as well. Uh, this is Tim List, or Tim Lester. He is, uh, uh, at that time, he was a district deputy grandmaster, District 10, uh, Washington. So it's Prince Hall, Washington State. Uh, that they're they're a, they're a big uh, Korea, and uh, I was confused, you know, at that time why why they weren't recognized because they were recognized in their own state for, you know, since like the early 90s, so that that kind of befuddled me for a while. 
Um, I'm a member of uh, OES in Nova Scotia. So uh, Nova Scotia, you know, they prints all regular, like way back in the early 90s. So it wasn't a big deal for me to uh, affiliate into their chapter. So I affiliated into their chapter. Uh, and so I could have more, you know, more access, more contact with these Prince Hall Masons because, you know, this was, uh, I, I didn't even realize that they were, there was recognition issues, you know, being from, uh, oh, we voted them regular years ago. So I thought there was no, no issue until I came to Korea and realized that wasn't the case. And I talked to uh, several brothers about it. Um, this is a, this is a uh, open installation. And this is probably the only time that we were actually able to sit with them. It's not an it's not a, a tile lodge. It's an open it's open installations. It's open to the general public. So this is the only time that we could really, you know, see each other, even though we weren't in amity with each other. And that the uh, the OES uh, matrons uh, there. Anyways, I talked to uh, after a while. Um, after getting in with them, uh, one of my friends, Derek, he's a past master of Hanyang. He was able to get a hold of these uh, these letters, and it, here's a copy of that. This is dated 1998, okay, to Scotland, the Grand Lodge of Scotland from Washington, and it's basically requesting uh, recognition. You know, so we didn't realize it because they were, we were saying, well, you guys need to get recognized. They said, oh, you just write a letter, and they said, well, we did write a letter, and he like. 20 years ago and here it is so i got i got these scans derek brother derek he gave me these scans i said wow look at this this is um and here's the here's the receipt the grand lodge of scotland yes we received it this, and uh he sent it back and that's from the uh, grand secretary and then another one from washington saying yes we did receive this letter in fact so we didn't really understand what was going on Scotland, they I, apparently the, they they had lost these letters. So, but luckily that Washington made copies or scans, so that I was, I was able to get a hold of these. Uh, I, I was going over to Hong Kong for the reinstallation of the District Grand Master, and uh, Brother Hugh Bryson, who is a past deputy Grand Master of Scotland, who came over from Scotland to perform this reinstallation ceremony he came over he also lived in korea for a time and he was also a past master of hanyang at that time i was the master of hanyang so uh, some of the other past masters in korea they said hey roger if you're going over to uh, hong kong for this reinstallation could you talk to brother Yu and could you give him copies of the letters and see if anything can be done about that so this is uh, i guess somebody caught a picture of us talking so that i get i and, you know, he was really busy, you know, uh, with uh, talking to other guys at the same time. So he kind of just uh, put him away. But the next day, the next morning, we went to a brunch and he came up to me and he said, Roger, you know, I looked at these letters and uh, this is this is kind of embarrassing. You know, this is this is a shame. This should never should have happened. So he uh, he said back to Scotland, I'm going to make sure this gets taken care of. Uh, he wrote a letter to uh, the district uh, or the grand secretary. You know, it says here, uh, during my stay in Hong Kong, I met with Roger, uh, the master of Hanyang. He gave me copies of the correspondence. You'll see that, yes, they did apply for recognition in 1998, but it appears this has fallen between the cracks. And as he, and I, as I said, and he reiterated, yes, it's, it's, a, uh, it's embarrassing amongst our brethren in Korea. And, it's, and it has caused some ill feeding between our constitutions, you know, especially since Washington had been you know, recognized in their own state for so many years. So he he requested that yes, let's uh, on our next committee meeting, let's uh, let's push this forward. And then here it is in the Grand Lodge proceedings uh, about a few months later. Uh, table of application for recognition from Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Washington. You know, agreed that that it now petition to recognize this uh, Grand Lodge uh, from Prince Hall Washington. And then later on. Uh, this transaction was considered and approved, and it's item number 13 bottom to extend recognition to Prince Hall. So it was approved. And then the very next day, the uh, annual communication in Hong Kong, uh, hot off the press from the regular communication yesterday, they have finally granted recognition to Prince Hall, Washington, which 
resolves a little dif local difficulty some of our lodges were facing in Korea. So after all that song and dance, finally, finally, <laughs> we were able to, get, to, to, to uh, sit and lodge with these guys. And uh, the first time we did it, guess who, st who uh, I was the master of Truman at that time. And guess who stepped on my front door? The same guy I had met years before. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, Tim Lister, and I, I didn't I didn't realize it was him at first until I in, until I realized it, and that was our third degree, and uh, so yeah, this is this is kind of a historical photo I guess you could say it was the uh, first uh, photographic evidence of uh, uh, Prince Hall Washington in a Scottish lodge, and since then yeah we've been we've been going back and forth. That's uh, me and a brother from Hanyang. We visited their uh, their uh, quarterly district session. So I, I, I just felt I had to tell you that story because that's, uh, you know, that, that's kind of important. Definitely. Well, I'm glad you did. And I, I commend you for your, your efforts in making sure that uh, that went through. Um, man, the, uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, kind of digital tourism you've brought to the show tonight is pretty amazing. Um, have that many pictures to kind of put you there firsthand is, is awesome. I hope our viewers really appreciate the, uh, the effort you've put into this and all the uh, pictures and stories you've brought. Um, definitely a, a wealth of knowledge as far as the history of uh, Korean Freemasonry and uh, bringing in the, uh, the foreigners coming over and then even the, the Prince Hall. Um, so I definitely thank you so much for your, your time tonight. And I want to hand it over to you. If you, if you have any final words and some uh, plugs you'd like to do for any uh, personal websites or anything. Well, I, I've been in Korea for seven years. And I got to tell you, yeah, it's, it's, it's been one heck of a ride. Um, this, unfortunately, this will probably be my last year in Korea uh, for a while. I'd like to go back someday, but probably not teaching English. Um, if I can go back, I would like to work with the U.S. military. It'll be, be a little bit harder for me being Canadian, but it would be something I'd be interested in doing. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, if you're ever in Korea, yeah, masonry is li alive and well. Even though we're, we're smaller, we're not as strong in numbers, but what we do have, uh, it's, it's really good quality. Um, and yeah, you can follow me on uh, my website, uh, koreafreemason.com and I usually uh, post quarterly updates just more photos like what you've been seeing and uh, I, I post articles from time to time there as well and uh, you can also follow me on Facebook I'm the uh, I run a Facebook uh, page it's called uh, maybe you've heard of it Alex it's called Masonic Memes oh yes uh, definitely yeah that's me um, actually, hey, you know what? I got I, I put some memes aside for this as well, so I'll show you, I'll show you my top four memes. Okay, so first one, let's see what do we have here. We have some road signs, some hand strength grips, some no cash value tokens, and a bunch of cutout words. And the caption reads, "Modes of recognition, whereby one mason may know another." <laughs> I've seen that flying around, to, and I mean that's this is years old, but I've seen that flying around for for a long time. So I, that, that's one of the most popular ones I've made. Uh, this one, I, I've seen this one actually. I think Todd Creason put this one up on the Midnight uh, Freemasons. I, I made this one years ago. So basically, yeah, the woman's consoling his her her poor husband who's depressed, and the the, the quote reads, "They made me secretary tonight." I venture to say there's some truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, I'm currently the secretary of Truman Lodge, so yeah, I kind of and that that kind of got put on me. Yeah, like that. So that was kind of my feeling at the same time. <laughs> It's not it's not easy being the secretary, but God bless our secretaries because they do so much work. Uh, oh yeah, is, I like this one. So it's Hulk Hogan. He's holding up a couple of twenty-four inch gauges, and the caption reads, "What you gonna do, brother, when these twenty-four inch gauges uh, inch gauges enlighten you?" <laughs> People like that one too. They thought it was pretty funny. And I think one more. Yeah, my last one. So you got a bunch of rich old men. Uh, drinking wine, laughing, and they're all wearing Scottish right caps. And it says, the caption says, and then I told the candidate, Master Mason is the highest degree. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is, is yes, of course, Master Mason is the highest degree. Independent bodies are more lateral than uh, vertical, but it, it makes fun of it. So, yeah. So, yeah, so you can follow me on there, too. And uh, I try to make, I, it's hard making Masonic memes. But I try to try to put one out every every ten days or so. 
Wonderful. Well, we will put those links on our site as well so everyone can uh, uh, get a hold of you. And we definitely want to thank you again. Uh, I know you say you guys are small in numbers over there, but you can definitely tell that uh, the heart behind it and uh, what is there is profoundly huge. So it seems like a great experience. I encourage anybody that has a chance to go over there to definitely stop in and visit one of the lodges. I know one of these days that is definitely on my to-do list. Uh, so thank you so much for everything you've shared tonight, brother, and we will see you soon. All right. You take care, brother Alex. All right. Thanks so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's interview. I know I always find it fascinating getting the history behind how some of these lodges from around the world came to be, uh, so I hope you do as well. We'll keep the conversation going for tonight's episode within our Facebook group. That is the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook. If you're not a member there, please pause the video right now, jump over and click join. Uh, that is the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook. Again, we keep the conversation for the show episodes going there, and I also have some great conversations popping up on a daily basis, so make sure you join and become a part of that and meet some new brethren within the group as well. As it is a growing community. We'd love to have you within that. So once again, that is the Historical Light Masonic Research Group. Go click join. We'd love to see you there. Now within that, we've been putting on a... Uh, a Facebook challenge that we've been advertising within the show episodes and social media as well um, for you to get out your camera phone or other device and record a short video answering why did you become a Freemason and we open that up not only to Freemasons but appendant bodies as well we want to hear from all of you so that's Eastern Star uh, Job's Daughters Rainbow Girl Demo Lay whatever it is we want to hear from you guys why did you join why is it so important to you uh, I think it's a great conversation starter and uh, you know, also go after the uh, the uh, past masters and older brothers within your lodge. There's so many stories there that you might be surprised you never heard before, and it's history that needs to be recovered and preserved. So definitely uh, record those videos and get those sent in. We still have a few uh, in the bank that we're going to be uh, highlighting at the end of the episodes. Uh, we'd love to get some more in to keep this going as long as possible and hear from as many of you as we can. Um, but we do have one of those tonight, so let's jump over and see why this brother decided to join Freemasonry. Hello, my name is Mike Hambrick and I belong to uh, Village Lodge, uh, number 274 in the Grand Lodge of Ohio. I'm also known as uh, Mike the Intern from the Masonic Roundtable. And why did I join Freemasonry? Well, just to make a long story short, I uh, started off uh, one night sitting with my wife watching uh, Secrets of Freemasonry and cons uh, Conspiracies in the United States TV show. And during that, I said, you know what? I've got to join the Masons. I've got to find out about all these secrets. So I contacted a lodge, uh, filled out a petition, and sometime between the time I filled out my petition and they actually talked to me about it, I had be, uh, uh, begun to research uh, Freemasonry. I, um, it took a few months. Um, they talked to me, told me some things that made me dig even deeper. Uh, but it was that whole thing about... Uh, what makes good about making good men better and uh i uh i liked that i liked the sound of that i had just lost all kinds of weight and felt that you know now that i look better i should be better let's you know let's start that path too so i began to head down that and in doing the same research uh i found that there was so much more to freemasonry than any of the conspiracy theorists or anybody who believes that, you know, we're trying to take over the world, anything they could possibly imagine is much more, is nowhere near as exciting as what really happens in Freemasonry. I mean, I started off uh, during my research, I found the Whence Came You podcast and went from there, found the Winding Stairs, and even from there, I found the Masonic Roundtable, Ex Oriente, and a few others. Uh, and I just began listening to podcast after podcast after podcast, learning and reading books and reading everything I could get my hands on on the Internet. And uh, to some extent, a uh, bad idea, but I read Duncan's Monitor and Ritual. Um, and I learned so much about what the real side of Freemasonry is that I gladly took the final step to initiation uh, in January of 2016. Um, so yeah, even from that point on, it has been a wild ride for me. I am actually uh, uh, sitting as junior steward at my lodge. I'm also the master of the first veil in my uh, local chapter as well. Uh, 
Thank you very much for this opportunity to tell you why I joined Freemasonry. I hope that uh, it helps somebody else uh, in their journey. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brother Mike, for uh, sending in that video reply and taking part in the Historical Light Facebook Challenge. I'm definitely grateful that uh, you made that leap into joining Freemasonry. And uh, I always enjoy your contributions over there at the Roundtable as well. So keep up the good work. Now, mentioning the Roundtable, I do want to plug once more. Uh, we talked about this last episode, but they do have an amazing event that they're in the middle of planning uh, to celebrate the 300th anniversary of uh, the United Grand Lodge of England and Freemasonry within. So definitely check them out at their website to get more information on that and get tickets to that event. Um, those guys do some great work over there. So uh, we definitely support them in their ventures and we hope you do as well. So check them out at their website and get some more information on how you can uh, take part in that event as well. Now with that said, um, Brother Mike, thank you again for sending in your video reply, and we hope the rest of you would do as well. Uh, like I said, we would like to keep this going just as long as possible, and I hear from just as many of you as we can, and I get a wide range of the history behind why people joined um, this amazing fraternity. So send those video replies in. We look forward to hearing from, again, not only Freemasons, but the appendant bodies as well, and we will see you next time as we continue our quest for historical light. Y'all have a wonderful day.